many successful professional uh, translators, uh, well, they have received extensive training uh, in their particular field, but everyone has started at some point. And when you start, you have to build the foundation. So you wouldn't be having the problems uh, and these bad habits that other translators have in terms of this um, quick uh, process of translation that they go through. Anything in the world basically has to be standardized if you want to achieve uh, the same result all the time. You know, the best football player is not, the, is not someone who scores 10 goals per match, but rather scores one goal every match. So to ensure quality, you need uh, sustainability, you need some method, some approach uh, that would help you to go through all this uh, process uh, step by step and uh, basically achieve the result that you are uh, expecting to achieve. So I will, uh, if you have a notepad and a pen, I would ask you also to write down some, just 10 words or 10 headlines. This is the, the parts and the steps of translation process that I would like you to go through. <clears throat> What do you think you need to do uh, when you get the text? So a client sends you a file, okay? It's a, it's, it can be a two-page document, 10-page document, or 100-page document. Well, the more the better for us, obviously. Uh, but first of all, uh, it, with any document that you have received, you need to make sure that you analyze the text. So please, uh, all of you guys, write down these words, analyze the text. Step number one, analyze the text. Okay, analyze the text. What analyze the text mean for a translator? The first, uh, first draft translation. So you need uh, to prepare. Analyze the, the, the analyzing the uh, the text means among many other things. Understanding the register. Is it formal? Is it casual? Is it a slang? Is it some taboo or um, other? type of vocabulary. What is the tone of the, of, the, of the text? Is it humorous? Is it marketing style? Is it convincing? Is it tragic? Is it polite, angry? This kind of things. Um, you understand that when you are a translator, you don't uh, translate the words, but you translate the meaning. And it's not easy thing. And sometimes many students of mine and, uh, well, in general, they sometimes they look at the sentence and they know all the words, but they still don't understand what the speaker wants to say. And this is one of the things where we as translators come to decipher, to decode this uh, equation. So you need to translate uh, the meaning. Uh, and uh, within analysis part, you need to also identify part of the text, words or phrases or sentences or longer sections that you do not understand. So you just analyze. You don't really start going into, oh, I don't know this word. You just highlight it. For example, in my case, I, I take the document, I look at it, I go through it right away. And then, well, for example, the words that I, I don't understand, I highlight them, the sentences or the phrases that I know but I am kind of suspicious about. I highlight them and leave it for the next stage because at this stage you just analyze. It's a superficial look. You look at it, you try to understand what is it. There are some parts that you will be able to translate right away without dictionary, without any help, and that's cool. But obviously in any document you will have this, you know, rocks that you don't want to step on so just highlight them underline whatever you like and then keep it for the next stage the the analysis analysis part is understanding the overall idea of the text you would not be able to translate properly if you don't read the text one at least once the whole text the entire text and understand all the specifics and all the tone and the connotation that this text brings about in analysis part, some of the things are also industry specific or um, document specific. You don't hear me, or you don't. Well, okay. Um, so is some of the texts are industry specific, uh, and some of them are document specific. For example, if in one document the speaker uh, uses the word uh, sustainability. And then you translate the word sustainability in different segments differently, that's a problem. Okay, that's called consistency. Well, the professional translators already know that. Well, consistency is important because that is, you know, they say in English, the devil is in details. So you need to be very sure that you translate the exact same word exactly in all of the cases when the term comes out. Uh, but 
for that, you need CAD tools. In some of the cases, if you, don't, if you are not rich enough to buy CAD tools or SDA or Trados or SmartCAD and others, then you use your own vocabulary, your own glossary, the database, what I call. And then you just have copy paste or you use Control F function to search for the word and, uh, and, and put it where it is needed. That is basically what is analysis part. Okay, guys. So step one, what is step one? Is step one is analyze the text or just in short analysis and I'll analyze the text. Okay. Now move to the next one. Please write down the step two. Guys, step two is research. Research. Please also put it in chat window if you have done it. So step one, analysis or analyze the text. Step two, research. Okay, so what is research? Research is, um, you know, you remember those words that you highlighted? The, you identified some of the words, phrases, and longer parts that you may not understand. So these parts have to be researched. And research means, well, first of all, is Google. Second is your professional vocabulary, if you have it. Uh, the internet, uh, native speakers, if you have friends, or and other professional translators and interpreters who are, you know, uh, leaders in this industry, you can always go to them. This is what we sometimes do in ATM group, if you recall. We go and, I mean, some people post the questions, how would you do this? How would you interpret that segment? How would you translate that phrase? Exactly what we are what we are doing in, the, um, in our social network. And um, so research, research all the unknown words, research all the phrases. Uh, you can go to multilingual dictionaries. You can go to monolingual dictionaries. You can go to native speakers and translators. Uh, in my case, for example, when I'm working with Spanish language, as you probably know, I'm Spanish-English mainly. Uh, Spanish has different variations, well, it, as English, but we're not, you know, our Azerbaijani translators don't work with, let's say, New Zealand, Australian English too much. But with Spanish, for example, I recently had a request from one government agency to translate their website into Spanish, but then I'm asking, who is the target audience? Who, who will be reading this? And Spanish has different variations, Spanish in Colombia, Spanish in Mexico, Spanish in Cuba, Spanish in Spain, American Spanish, Spanglish, you know, whatever you like. So given my background in South America, I sometimes uh, want to use more Colombian Spanish, you know, or Mexican. But I always downgrade myself into Spanish, Spanish, classical, standard Spanish. The same happens with Arabic. If you, don't, if you know Arabic, there's a... Uh, Uspa or something like this is classic Arabic and then many of other uh, variation, Mar Moroccan, uh, I don't know, Egyptian, Syrian, and so on. Okay, so in this part of the second uh, step, research, you need to research what English or what Spanish you are going, you are going to employ. There's also very, you know, the interesting things happening about um, English. If you say British word in an American text, an American word in a British text, sometimes it can cause confusion. Sometimes it can cause, you know, why? Why are you doing this? And so uh, misunderstandings and problems, you know. So, for example, one, one time I used the word, uh, instead of disabled, I used the word handicapped because to me it seemed less uh, aggressive, less vulgar. Uh, but I was corrected, you know. They say, well, we, here we don't use the word handicapped. We use disabled. And I'm saying, well, disabled is something not very, that doesn't sound very nice. But no, they say handicapped is even worse in our understanding. So you need to understand the difference and variations, okay? That also goes back to the context and connotations, okay? So the research part is uh, check the internet for the unknown words, phrases, uh, check with other translators, how would they express that. Uh, maybe some of the key uh, anthropological terms may, may uh, need some further investigation, okay? So that was step two. Step two is research. Research everything about uh, the document, which wasn't identified properly, and you couldn't say that, okay, I know that. Okay, ready for step three now? Step three is develop a, a, a glossary, or just glossary. I mean, we can put it, please, like this. Develop a glossary or develop a or uh, just glossary, translation glossary, obviously. So during the analysis step and the research step, you, you will encounter words and phrases uh, and acronyms, for example, that you that are unique to this document. And unique, well, obviously, it's, it hasn't been used uh, previously 
in other documents you haven't seen it so please uh, write down them in all uh, right i mean jot them down in your database so your database can be as simple as an excel sheet with all the words that you know that, that are problematic or more professional one uh, database programs and softwares uh, or um, cat tools again we go back to the automatic um, computer assisted um, Man, I mean software, so you can use this or that the way you want and the way your pocket is structured. I mean, if you have money enough to pay for that, please do. Uh, this develop the glossary means put the industry specific words into that file. Okay, industry specific words into that file. Uh, because why? I mean, you will forget it. You will forget in, in a week time, in a, in a month's time, you may forget this word. Specific, for example, automobile industry, specific, or, you know, specific related terms to cars, to vehicles, to military. For example, once I was working in a military base in Baku, and um, we had a, a, a warfare training. Basically, the UK officials were training our people in Navy how to how to fight a war, how to wage a war, and uh, the strategy and the techniques, and this is these are this very very specific words, and you have to consider them. So put them in your glossary and have it in front. You know, just refresh it all the time. Terminology, acronyms, you know, acronyms, abbreviations, names, industry specific words. You can make it uh, a glossary, just a glossary, maybe with some explanation, or you can make it bilingual. If you want a bilingual, that's even better, but that would be uh, that would be a little, a little bit more challenging. Uh, but first, understand the meaning and then go for the translation. Okay, this this will make it easier for your consistency. So, step one: analyze the text. Step two: research. Step three: develop a glossary. Okay, are we clear? Say hi in the chat window. Okay, uh, let's move to the step four. Okay, step four. Step four is uh, basically write the first draft. Step four is write the first draft. Just put it like this, literally, write the first draft. And write the first draft. Uh, Salman comments that, yes, he has a tri trilingual dictionary. That's, that's good. When I was studying in the university, I had, uh, I had a dictionary that I prepared and compiled that was in three languages, and then I added the fourth one. And that's uh, heck of a lot of a job, but it really pays off. Okay, guys, uh, step four is write the first draft. Write the first draft. Well, you you researched, you analyzed, you understand, and just start translating. Okay, uh, do it. It should be kind of you know freestyle uh, writing. You know, sometimes they say there's a free speaking exercise. You speak. Without stopping, it helps your speaking ability, and uh, you, you you describe everything what's happening around you, and that helps your uh, you know verbal expression very well. And the same may can be can kind of be applied to uh, translation. In written form, your first draft should be the best uh, draft that you can uh, develop uh, right away without spending too much time on specifics okay so this is the first draft don't worry it's the first draft nobody's asking you to kind of prepare the the ideal perfect uh translation right away it's the first draft it's a process okay so number four is a first draft number four uh it is this uh, translation has to be done freely strive attempt to make sure that the words flow you know that they flow naturally in your language in your target language because many people sometimes when they read the translation say like what is this a robot's translation i mean make it natural this is a detail that will set you apart from other translators that translate the words you translate the meaning and you make it natural you make it that like the person is, is reading is not reading the translation but is reading the original that's a that's a top top notch uh, translator this is, this is you know high caliber translator who does everything perfectly so i want you to be one of these uh, uh, translators. Uh, you start to write your first draft. Your first draft goes freely with the words that you know. You write away. It's automatic. You already researched. You are prepared. But even in this case, by the end of this two-page document, you will have problems. You will have issues because you forgot, because something doesn't sound well, because maybe 
um, you forgot a word, and, and something like this, yeah? Uh, don't worry, just leave it like this. You can even, uh, you can even keep the original, the, the source language word in the target language just right away. For example, you say, I want to, and you don't know the word, just keep it like this in a foreign language and then go back to it and, and, and uh, it will help. Why? Because if you focus on every word, every time you start working, then you get tired very quickly, okay? Translation, translating and uh, interpreting is a very energy-consuming uh, job. And if you don't want to be dead in 10 or 20 years in this profession, you need to uh, streamline your energy and your resources, okay? So if you don't know the word, keep it, go back to it later. Another word, another phrase, keep it, go back to it later. Don't worry, it's the first draft. And um, when, you get to end, when you get to the end of your draft, you can go back and look at the problem areas, and sometimes the word just comes out. Sometimes you don't do anything, but the word comes out, and you just remember, okay? It's called agility. Sometimes when a person is put in a very risky situation, his brain starts to act uh, very, very quickly. Um, I was playing one game with one with one of our friends uh, yesterday. We went to see his family, and he, he's from Canada. So basically, we were playing games with his kids, and they were ask. I was asking them uh, words in, in Turkish, and uh, they were they were supposed to give me a translation in English. So, and I let them win until we would play until score ten, and it was the score was nine six. And then, okay, I said, okay, I will make it more interesting. And then I, I started to ask a little bit more complicated word in English, and they couldn't do it in, in Turkish. So it was nine six nine seven nine eight nine nine, and then they said, "Okay, we will use the help of our father." And I said, "Please be my guest." And they went to to, to their father, and they lived most of their life in Canada. And he said, and they asked him, "Okay, tell me a word." And he said, "Okay, he wouldn't he wouldn't know that." He said, "What is in English, Burundeshi?" Uh, and um, and and in fact, I kind of forgot that word uh, because I, I didn't hear it for a long time. And it was funny because his kids were, you know, uh, laughing and saying, "Yeah, uh, we we beat you," and so on. And then I took a couple of seconds of my time, and then because of this risky kind of uh, threatening situation, and I was like, my brain started to function better, I think. And I say, correct my pronunciation. But it looks to me, if my memory serves me, it's nostril. And then th this guy was shocked. His kids were shocked. And the whole family said, oh, okay, you know. So the, 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 the morale of this example is that your brain really starts to react to the external challenges that are placed on you. If somebody wants to hit you, you start to be very, very reactive and very agile. You know, the same with your brain, you know. I do it, for example, all the time. I enjoy it. It's my adrenaline in, in simultaneous interpretation when I do it. You know, it's, it's too much. It's, it's a lot of speed, a lot of stress, and but I love it. And you need to streamline it, of course. The point is that your brain reacts. Okay? That was the example with your first draft. Uh, sorry for off top a little bit. Um, you, write, you wrote the first draft. You know what now? You take a break. So... You take a break uh, and you come to the stage number five. I mean, after two, you take a break for an, a, maybe a day, a couple of hours if you don't have time, you go back to it. Why do you need to take a break? Well, taking a break helps to refresh your eye vision, helps you to relax a little bit, go back, have an orange juice, a cup of coffee, walk for half an hour, come back to the computer, Look at it again with a new eye. And sometimes I, 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 I don't do translation a lot, but um, sometimes when I do with, with a very important document and so on, I, I do with my first draft, I leave it. I go play with my kids, I don't know, do something funny. And then I come back and I look at the translation and I'm asking, who wrote this stuff? You know, I sometimes hate myself. I sometimes think that what is this? You know, why, why should I? Why, why have I put it like this and like that? So in that sense, uh, give yourself give yourself a break, half an hour, one hour, two hours, as much as you can. Okay, and then go back to it. That will increase your um, quality, increase increase your efficiency and productivity at the same time. 
So your first draft is ready. Now you come to the intermediate and intermediate uh, draft, which is almost pre-final draft. Okay. Step number five. After the first draft, write the first draft. There it was number four. Now we go to step number five. Step number five is edit for style. Style. Style is first of all no grammatical errors. Style it should sound natural. You you just read it and you and and you kind of um, you adjust your ear to that. Sometimes uh, in Russian we say режет uh, ухо. Sometimes you 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 read the text and you kind of feel from inside like hey something is wrong here something doesn't sound completely well. So in that in that scenario, make sure it it, it is. Um, as natural as it as it can be, uh, it can it should be an equivalent. If the if the speaker of the text, I mean, if the writer of the text is uh, ha is having a kind of a persuasive speech, then you have to make it persuasive, obviously, in the um, in the in the target language. These are your objectives for your style: uh, connotations, register, slang, grammar mistakes, natural flow, and so on. Okay. That was step number five. Now we go to step number six. Okay. Great on the ears. Thank you, Salman. I didn't know that word, by the way. So uh, step number six, uh, format the translation. The translation shall be format, mm -hmm. uh, formatted exactly like the original source of the, uh, of, I mean, of the files that you, that you have got. Unless you are told otherwise, for example, if this if this document was provided in this way, you, you deliver it. The translation should be identical. Now here we have a problem of uh, PDF files. I don't know, um, JPEGs, scanned, uh, horrible copies of certain unknown documents, uh, very complicated DVG or other extension formats that you may face. Okay, so you need to consider this, and you need to charge for that. Okay, there's no free. Kind of right here. Don't do it just because they pay you, you know, twelve minutes. Don't uh, don't work with uh, AutoCAD files and say that, hey, yeah, I'm a good guy. I will do it for free for you. Okay, so charge for that also. Uh, uh, step number six. Can you please write it down in the chat window? Nubar was very good with it. Uh, step number six is what? Step number six is format the translation. Um, formatting the translation, there are a lot of things. There's a font, spacing, and uh, centric, indenting, left or right justification, certain characters, underlined text, colors, borders, shading, bullets, numbering, and so on. Okay. Um, graphics. I mean, just format. So when you, you, you have your draft, you take a break, you look at it. You edit for style. When you edit for style, don't look at other things. When you edit for format, don't look at other things. Don't look at grammar things if you're editing for, for fonts and for colors and for underlines. You know, it distracts your brain. You will get crazy if you do it all the time. Focus on one thing. Some people, for them, I work as a proofreader also in many cases. For them, you know, I, I've been writing a column in the newspaper and so on. So the editor or a proofreader, they look at one particular element of the, of, the, of the entire text and then focus on it, and that makes it perfect. If you, if you think about, for example, okay, I will check the dots and the commas here, but on the way, you start to kind of, oh, and that's here, this, and that's a grammar mistake here, this, and that's an inappropriate uh, word uh, or word here. So, and you start correcting, then you get distracted and you don't reach the conclusions that you want to. Because, you know, you need to focus on one thing, you need to be very detail-oriented, and then, only then, your job, your, your work will be perfect. Because you focus, if you focus on commas, your brain has to look for commas only. Don't get him distracted. Uh, don't get him distracted by other things and words that you may find uh, problematic. That will come in the end, okay? So, follow this, the steps, and you will be fine. Now... Format uh, step number six. Step number six, as I said, colors, fonts, um, style. Uh, I mean, typography. Yeah, bullets, numbering, graphics, and so on. Okay. 
Then we go to step number uh, step number seven. Step number seven is a review for uh, accuracy. Let me find it. I find my notes. So review for accuracy means you here you check the specific terms again. You try to make it as accurate as possible. Uh, let me move my comments one second. Okay, so review for accuracy. You you look for the you look for the specific uh, problematic words that you have translated. Double check them. Review for accuracy mainly goes with the step number eight, which is a proofread. It's basically final proofread. So with a final proofread, you can do it yourself. But if you want to be professional, have it have another guy uh, uh, next to you uh, and ask him to read it for you. Okay. Um, it's always good to work with native speakers if you have one. If you don't have one, uh, look for a professional translator that you know. Ask him. Sometimes it's free of charge. I mean, it's your colleague. He may do it just because he likes you. Uh, and sometimes you have to pay for that. Um, and that's okay. I mean, if you charge, for example, 15 manat per page, why not paying one manat or whatever, you know, for a proofread to another professional guy? If you are a professional translator, Ask someone else to read it. Pay him and you will have a partnership if you trust his knowledge. If you think that he's, you know, smarter, intelligent, more professional experience than you, please do. And once you do it, well, it's beneficial not only in terms of the uh, qualities that you will provide, but also in terms of the future clients, uh, future volume of work that this gentleman can give you. Okay. So they say sharing is caring. So share with other people and they will give you more work. Don't be an egocentric, selfish guy who's, who thinks that he can do all this, all the work himself. Usually you don't. Okay. So work with other translators. That's the key reason why we have a Azerbaijan translator network. Work with other people. Share. And you will see the benefit of that. You will see it in terms of the more volume. You will see it in terms of the more quality job that you um that you provide that you provide and so on murad asked a question do you know any good editors uh you are talking to one of the good editors if i can say so uh, there are other people that i work with uh, in terms of the editing in russian language if you want you can drop me a line and i can uh give the, uh, give their contacts to you uh so you could work with them in future directly or through through me as you wish okay uh if any questions you can ask right away by the way now, step number uh, seven we said is review for accuracy. Step number eight was proofread. That's the final proofread by you, by someone else. Step number nine, we are coming to the end of our uh, webinar. Step number nine is uh, deliver the project. Well, deliver the project, you basically, you know, is it, is it a hard copy that should be delivered? Is it, um, uh, is it an e-version, the soft copy that you need to send? Um, and um, in which format some people prefer, I mean, name it appropriately. For example, don't call it translated by John Smith on January 17th. So, I mean, it's too long and sometimes it's inappropriate. You know, details, guys, okay? Details. It's marketing in many cases. So step nine, step number nine, deliver the project. You send an email. In most of the cases, we work by email. So send an email. Uh, and uh, one more piece of advice, put a nice um, accompanying uh, text there saying that, dear John, dear, I don't know, dear Murat, uh, please see attached um, the file translated. You can put some specifics. For example, I explain the client the challenges of this text. I explain that this is what I have encountered. This was edited for style, for format. If I I'm, if I'm send a document for proofread, I said, Dear John, this document has been proofread, has been edited for content, for, for, for format, for style. This is a challenging thing. So you inform the client and the client knows that, hey, Elnur has done a pretty good job. Elnur gives me an analysis of what has happened. It raises the awareness and it looks very, very professional, guys. Okay, It looks extremely professional if you do this. And not just saying, hey, here you go. 
I mean, between us, the translators, we can do it, but with the clients, I don't suggest that because, you know, you, you need to build your, your reputation. You need to build your, build your brand image. Exactly what I did throughout my life, uh, very, very detailed approach to the client's needs, and then you will be fine. Deliver, you deliver the project, and, well, you may think that that's it, and uh, you are done, you will, should be get paid, and that's it. No, in fact, it's not. There's one more, uh, you know, there's one more uh, step uh, on top of that. It's very, very critical. I will ask a question. Who can guess what, what, uh, what will that step be? Step number 10. If you can write it in the chat window, your guesses. What is step number 10 in the translation process after you deliver the project? No comments so far. Yes, absolutely, it's feedback. So uh, you need to have. Nubar says Tajma is That's also a possibility, but that goes from the exactly from the step number ten, which is the feedback. Step number ten is uh, asking them. So if I send uh, if I send my file to Vugar, for example, and I call Vugar and say, "Hi Vugar, um, I have sent you the file with my analytical breakdown, and I hope you like it. Uh, can you please comment on how was it? Did you like it? Uh, were there parts that were you know unclear? How can I improve next time? And uh, blah 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 blah. This kind of thing. So it's a it's a perfect uh, it's a scenario for customer relationship. Um, and uh, if Tarjima really guides you, then you have a real problem. Then there are many things that you can do. First of all, you can stop being a translator and do something else. Uh, well, second, you can still improve if you want this job so much. Uh, third, you may lose your client and you have problems and so on. But that's another webinar, you know, for the customer relationship, customer relations, so on. So. Uh, if the client is happy with you, then perfect. Then ask for payment. I think Vugar said yes. Ask for payment, please. Uh, when when you can ask? Literally, when should I expect my paycheck? Uh, and if the pro if the if the translation is problematic, then you need to improve it. Maybe there are some things that you can improve right away, even without you know sending back and forth this file. Maybe he says something to you. You know what, Eleanor? We haven't. We we are not using that word for this one. And then you say, okay, sure. I take a note. You jot it down. You go to the tech computer. You, you you change it right away, and you send an updated version saying edited or v. I, I use it for example, v1 version one, version two, version three, to keep it consistent and simple. Okay, and that's it. Um, you you get uh, your. Feedback and well, ideally you get your paycheck on time and everyone is happy. And uh, Salman is posting the steps. Absolutely, this is exactly what we need now. Again, so let's uh, let's remind ourselves uh, about the ten steps of translation. Please write it down for yourself and print it and uh, put it on your wall. Make a lot of uh, you know tags and note notes notes everywhere so you would remember that you need to follow this uh, procedure it's like quality assurance okay uh, so analyze the text research develop a glossary write the first draft edit for style format the tra uh, translation review for accuracy proofread deliver and ask for feedback okay that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, shoot. There are some already. For example, Magomed is asking, is a translator more morally right to delete a feedback? Is not professionally argumented? I, I didn't understand this. Can you please rephrase? Does, does a translator have a moral right? Or what do you mean? I, I didn't get it. Seville writes, uh, most clients refuse to give your feedback saying they don't know yet. Yes, uh, it's true. I mean, call them first after you deliver and then call them in two or three days. Double check. You always have a contact person. Yeah, double check. They usually speak the language anyways. If they don't, well, your proofreader, another person may help you to give a feedback. 
Okay. Other questions or comments? If uh, if the client says uh, I didn't like the translation, then uh, you ask why. You know, um, as in Azerbaijan, the clients they say I don't like the translation. They don't uh, they don't answer why, and that's a problem. Then in this case, they just want to bump you, and they don't care about you. But you are if you are professional, you need to explain that hey, you know, I'm doing uh, I'm I'm, a, I'm I, I run the business here, so uh, you you need the information to improve. If this is a long-term client, they would not do it. If it's a one-time client, then, well, what you can do? Nothing. Uh, another question uh, from Salman. What if the source text, source text is in a bad condition? Could I tell the person who wrote the document to correct some mistakes there? That's very good. Uh, yes, you need to inform the client that the, the original file, the source file, is not, is not well prepared, is not well written. And in this case, as you highlight these segments and you, you make notes and you send it to them saying that these things are not appropriate in, in English or in Azerbaijan, in Russian, you wouldn't believe how much text I translate uh, from Russian that are very bad written, you know. And even in Azerbaijan, one sentence, one paragraph, like this long, so. Um, yeah. There's a way that the client may may think the translator is not confident. Uh, Murad has a point. Uh, if he insists, I'm not asking you to insist. I'm asking you to call once after you deliver a project. If they are not sure yet, uh, call in five days saying that, hi, hello. Uh, do you have any comments for me before I'm being paid? Because I am uh, caring for my clients. Shape it as a customer relations. Don't say that, oh, can, uh, can you tell me about my translation? Not, not like this. I told you I, I told you once in the webinar, in the trainings that I had in Daniel Chi Tower, what I do with simultaneous interpretation consecutive, I approach the client, I tell him, to ensure the quality of translation, please do this, this, and that. You can do the same with translation. I do it with interpretation, you do it with translation. To ensure the quality of translation for your own benefit, do this and that, okay? That's it, I think. Okay, guys, that was short. We have spent, I don't know how much time we spent, uh, but I think that's enough. If there are no other questions, we will say goodbye to each other, yeah? Okay, guys, uh, this, uh, I, I, I would like to try to upload this webinar to uh, our network so many more people can actually watch it and, and uh, well, maybe relate to the, and resonate to the questions uh, that you have asked. Uh, I think that was okay. It's the first time for me also. It was a little bit strange to talk to myself uh, without you saying anything and just chatting because I need to open a lab window. But next time we may we may try to do it in Skype or elsewhere. Thank you, and I enjoyed uh, sharing my knowledge with you. Uh, and uh, that's it. Have a good day.